last week, one of our forum faculty called our group a think tank. Um, and I take that to heart and extend that characterization to our entire program. Forum is the place where we can all ask our deepest questions, explore processes we've never tried, um, and take these risks in community. One of the things that makes MICA so special is that students and faculty are in that think tank together. I've been very inspired by all of you, faculty and students. Your enthusiasm, integrity, wisdom, and curiosity it's been a great joy to work with you in this role. I thank you for that. Um, students, today's lecture is about directions you might take now that you've laid your foundation. Hopefully by now you've found some questions that are of particular interest to you. If those questions are at all involved with the environment or with how groups of people behave, today's lecture is for you. Micah faculty Maya Chow, Hugh Pocock, and Kelly Williams are here to talk with us about social practice in the ESJ major. They will be introduced by Carissa Aoki, a Micah faculty who has a fascinating practice that combines interdisciplinary strategies to that work at the intersection of landscape, disturbance, and risk. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Um, so as she said, my name is Carissa Aoki, and I am in the Humanistic Studies Department. So I'm trained as an ecologist. I have degrees in gender studies, forest science, and ecology. Um, and I'm here because I am part of the new interdisciplinary major, Ecosystem Sustainability and Justice, which we're very excited to be launching. Um, and in spite of me being liberal arts, um, it's a studio major that is intended to be interdisciplinary and is very bound up in social practice, which you'll be hearing all about today. Um, so I'm very honored to be able to introduce our three speakers. I hope they don't mind my taking the liberty of just reviewing a little bit from their bios. I know you received them in the email, um, but I'm just gonna kind of quickly give a few highlights. So um, first, Hugh Pocock received his BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute and then his MFA at UCLA in New Genres. Um, his work seeks as a location the points of transaction between culture and natural phenomena, the confluence of labor, machinery, civic institutional infrastructure, and natural resources, such as water, air, dirt, wind, bring to the surface that which, in its abundance, tends to become invisible to us. Kelly Williams is an alumna of Morgan State University, where she majored in fine arts with a concentration in photography. She received her MFA from Columbus College of Art and Design. She is an animator, visual artist, and community artist. In her personal work, she uses stop motion animation, photography, installation, and humor to create work that comments on society through the lens of social media and technology. Maya Chow has a BA in anthropology from Brown University and an MFA from RISD. Um, she's a member of the artist collective Vox Populi in Philadelphia. And she is an interdisciplinary artist whose work examines informal and formal institutions such as family, school, museums, language, economic, and legal systems. Working collaboratively in performance, video, sculpture, and social practice, she frequently draws on methods from anthropology, linguistics, and psychology. Um, so I'm very excited to hear from these three, three of my colleagues today. Um, so please welcome, I think first we're having you, is that correct? Maya. Or Maya? Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Carissa, and thank you, Elizabeth, and everyone for um, who's organized this. So my name's Maya Chow, um, and I am a full-time professor in FYE. I just started this past year, so this is my second semester, so I'm kind of in the first year experience with you. <laughs> um, I'm a freshman kind of in my own way. Um, and I'm currently teaching designing information um, and, <laughs> and um, moving image one in film and video. Um, so, and I will be teaching social practice um, at MICA in 2024. So this is kind of a plug and also an introduction to what social practice is. I'm gonna share a little bit about myself um, and then about kind of this genre of art making called social practice um, and how it might relate to being a student at MICA. 
And then I'm gonna share a project briefly that a social practice project that I've done. Um, so uh, just a little background, both my parents were art teachers. Um, so I come from an art education background. I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. I um, studied at Brown and, and studied cultural anthropology and then went on to RISD um, for grad school. And so that's kind of my educational background. Um, but as a kid, you'll see an, uh, this image from a project of mine. As a kid, I um, had a cashier alter ego um, named Ebony Cheffa, and um, I had this fictional store in my parents' basement called Harlan's, um, and I was obsessed with customer service and transactions. Um, so I priced, I had a price gun, I priced everything in my parents' pantry in the basement and put my parents through a very rigorous bureaucratic um, process to remove any item from the stock in our basement. So I was really fascinated, I made them sign many, many forms to like take a can of beans out from the pantry. And I was really fascinated by these kind of procedural systems that we use to relate to one another. Um, and so that feels like a, a precursor to my going into social practice. I was really into that grocery store, over-the-counter moment. Um, and I now kind of understand my fascination um, with people and power and labor um, as a direct result of my own subject identity. Um, I identify as queer, biracial, um, Asian American, and I move between distinct cultural contexts. So um, I'm hyper aware of, and I think make work from a place of knowing this around the idea of belonging, um, assimilation, code switching, um, studying kind of the unwritten rules of a culture. Um, so I studied cultural anthropology and, and I, I went on to study art um, with a lot of the same interest in people and the systems and ways that we relate to one another. So um, I'm gonna start with just this silly emoji slide, which I didn't know emojis could scale this big, but they do. Um, and so uh, I, I thought I would just uh, start with saying social practice, the, the simplest way of, of identifying this term as a, as a genre um, is that the social is the medium of social practice. So as a sculptor might work with wood, metal, et cetera, et cetera, um, and a painter might work with paint, um, a social practice artist would be working with people, systems of power, institutions, how kind of social relationships. So that's kind of um, the, 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 the sound bite about social practice. Um, so what does that mean? Um, so this is a new genre. It's, um, it's a form of participatory kind of art activism um, that tries to bring about change within specific communities. Um, so what is it? The medium, I would say, is often focused on people. The social interaction or um, the experience is the medium. Um, and then how often the tools used, how social practice projects get pulled off. Um, they're, they're often very collaborative, um, participatory, community building, and time-based. Time-based um, both in terms of maybe they're using time-based media, but um, I think of social practice as a time-based medium because building relationships is a time-based process. Uh, building trust between people you're working with, um, especially if they're from distinct communities, is inherently takes time. Um, and so what does it do, why, why does it exist? It's often dealing with political issues, activism, um, change, trying to bring about change in some way, and it's certainly not commercial. So you know, when we think about selling work in galleries or something, often it's dematerialized, so there's not necessarily an object, but there's maybe an experience, an event, an ongoing process. Um, so, and then where is it? It's often place-based, um, so that might be in a particular community. It's often outside of a gallery or a museum, which has its own kind of preset notion of 
or preset community of people that go to galleries and museums. Um, and when, <laughs> when did this emerge? Well, it's happening now. Um, it began in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and it is sometimes called socially engaged art, activist art. There are many different terms. It's a little confusing because it's a, a nebulous term uh, or a nebulous genre and then also mixed in with a bunch of different terms. We've got community art here at MICA. We've got um, social design. Um, so this is social practice, and it has a very specific kind of history and um, context in, in fine art. Came out of fluxus and situationists, and um, these are some like art historical con kind of precursors as well, if, if you're interested in that kind of thing. So um, I tried to bullet out some different kind of tenets or beliefs of social practice. Um, art is the questioning of traditional models. Art is the production of human relations. Art generates transformation. Art enables heterodoxies, um, meaning like not orthodoxy, not convention or conforming, but heterodoxy, um, kind of defying traditional structures. Um, art is social justice. Art is resistance. Art challenges. So a social practice artwork might take the form of any of these various things, and this is not an exhaustive list at all, but it might take the form of a meal, um, a gathering, a workshop, a focus group, a routine, a performance, a program, a conversation, an interaction, maybe an organization of some kind, if you think of artist collectives or nonprofits that sometimes form out of no social practice projects. Um, it might be an event, uh, show and tell, a protest, um, a ritual, or a collective. Um, again, like a, a group that might form out of a project. Um, and these are all in the name of social connection or social change. So um, what does social practice have to do with being a student at MICA um, and with being a first year student? I would argue that um, the first year of college is an ideal time to be engaging in social practice. It's a time of immense social transformation. You've left home, uh, presumably, or you're in a new context. If you haven't, you're, in a, you're in, on a new campus. Um, you've moved to a new place, and you're working within a new system. How do you check things out? How do you get from point A to B? Um, Maybe you've, you're even learning and learning in a, a new language. Um, you're trying on different identities, dyeing your hair different colors, getting some piercings, <laughs> figuring out who you are, um, articulating your values and beliefs. Um, and so all of these things are, are the kind of the material of social practice, um, like making new friends, um, navigating new systems, uh, building self-knowledge, you're like, becoming aware of your rhythms, you, how you sleep when you need to wake up. Um, all of those things could be fodder for artwork. Um, and so I think of it um, as a really exciting opportunity to um, integrate life with art and to use art as a tool for growth and change and healing and learning. Um, so my art, I'll briefly just touch on because we're all kind of, uh, Hugh and Kelly will also be presenting and then we'll do a Q&A after that. Um, but I just wanted to share a little bit about how I come to social practice as an artist. Um, my art often is responding to a problem or experience of suffering of some kind, maybe it's inequity, maybe it's competition, maybe it's alienation. Um, and often I think at the core of my work, I'm trying to facilitate some kind of repair or healing, um, asking people to co-imagine and rehearse alternative ways of relating to one another. Um, and so I'm excited by kind of the challenge of devising solutions-oriented um, interventionist kinds of projects. Um, so I do a fair amount in performance and video, which I'm not really going to share today. Um, that kind of supplements my social practice work, and it's 
part and parcel of a greater um, kind of ecosystem of, of how I work. Um, but I am going to show you um, a work that I have done over many years. Um, I forgot I just added this sli slide in because um, I saw this while riding the elevator in the main building. Uh, make dorms accessible, Carter Spear Glace should have elevators. I can easily see a social practice project coming out of this uh, effort. So kudos to whoever's working on that and also uh, come talk to me <laughs> um, and Kelly and Hugh because that it's an opportunity to integrate your kind of things you might already be doing, activism on campus, um, things, you know, if you want to deal with some, you know, feel like there's some shit to deal with at MICA that you want to really like get involved with, social practice is a way to in, kind of put that into your art. Um, so, um, this is Look at Art, Get Paid. Um, it's a multi-year social practice project that I co-created with my collaborator, Josephine Davenboo. Um, and it's simply put, it's um, a program at a museum, an art museum, that pays people who don't visit art museums to visit one as guest critics of the art and the institution. Um, and this project kind of questions the innate value of art and art institutions um, to the greater public. Um, it's reversing flows of money and power using the private money. In this case, um, the pilot took place at RISD, at the RISD Museum. So reversing the private money, redistributing private money from RISD to the greater public, and specifically the public that isn't served by museums. So. Um, I was actually a grad student when I first came up with this with my collaborator, and we were participating in critiques. I know Liz Lerman came to speak with you, and you're thinking a lot about critique. And we were thinking about who gets to participate in critique, and um, who cares or even has the um, opportunity to take the time to look at art and talk about art and make meaning together. So um, I'm going to play an excerpt um, of kind of a mini documentary um, that we made about the project, which is a social practice project. Um, and it's about five minutes long. Art promises to bring about change, but many art institutions still serve the elite. Museums receive public money to serve the public, but they hear from and answer to the people who show up, a small segment of the population that doesn't reflect the whole. To truly serve the public, museums must understand what their galleries feel like to the demographic majority outside their current visitor base. It was just like an everyday thing for me. I'm going outside, I walk up the street, and I see tags on the floor, on the ground. I'll see tags on a mailbox, and it's just, who is that? What are they about? You know, their street credibility, so to speak. And it's just, going through a museum, it's the same thing. How high, highly regarded is, is this artist? Even looking down there, there's graffiti right there, and you can just see it on the wall, and you can just go down the stairs or, you know, look at high art, I guess. And it's just who dictates where art should be. I, I've lived uh, in Providence <clears throat> good 30, 40 years, 40 years, and uh, I, I never knew this was a museum. And I come by this street a lot. So I never felt like, oh, okay, I guess it's not really, not necessarily not a public space, but maybe it's just not a space for me. I'm really glad that I did come today because I was like, I never knew. And there was a picture by Jean Metzinger over here. And there wasn't enough pink paper to see all the things I've seen mm -hmm. with that one photograph. But I will take a picture and send it to Walgreens and put it in my living room and post the size. That picture just kept calling me. You know that table? I'm sure a lot of you liked it. That's all there. Mm -hmm. I asked him if you could purchase, if anybody, you know, there's rich people that might come to the museums and have a lot, a lot of money. And I said, if I run with the Powerball, I'm coming to get that table. <laughs> so I asked him, can you purchase any of the displays? And he said, no. But you know, when you got money, I'll work around that. <laughs> I'm just saying. 
the first thing that happened to me was I went and set off an alarm. I wasn't even doing anything. I just like was looking. I was leaning too far, and the alarm goes off, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I just am so afraid that I'm going to do something wrong. <laughs> like, I don't want to mess with anybody's art. I don't want to break anything. I don't want to be disrespectful. So I'm, I'm really hesitant to, like, interact with things unless I get something telling me, like, it's okay. If, like, somebody who came here, you know, just Spanish speaking, they wouldn't know where to go or, like, what any of the descriptions were saying. Mm -hmm. And I felt like... And I felt like, oh, you know, that could have been me or anyone. Because I was just looking at them, I like it or I don't like it. And then I stopped to read them. And once I read them, I actually liked it a lot more. Yeah. So the more I read, the more I understood, yeah. the more I enjoyed. The capto el nombre y la fecha. Mm -hmm. Pero se supone que algo histórico que por eso está aquí, pero eso no lo puedo captar. Encuentras el autor. Encuentras el título. Pero cuando vas al año... Tú te confundes porque el autor tiene un año, Ajá. el sí. título tiene otro año, y cuando tú lees la historia <risa> tiene otros años, tú dices en cuánto se hizo. Eh. Tú sabes, si tuviera como ciertas palabras clave hasta en inglés, uno sí. podría deducir, sí. Ajá, aunque fuera en inglés, pero que uno puede deducir que es por el poco idioma que uno... Claro. O no sé si es que el museo está dirigido a otro tipo de personas. For my personal home culture, no, there was no like representation. Same. Hmm. I mean, because I'm Afro-Caribbean, and I didn't see much African art, and I did not see any Caribbean art, or even Caribbean artists really being represented. Hmm. So, I mean, for me, if I were to go to a museum and I see that stuff, that automatically excites me. And, and here are your two guest passes. <laughs> $75 is a lot of money to serve people. I mean, even now, you can get a lot with $75, but at the end of the day, there are paintings that cost $15 million or a painting that'll cost $25 million, and then they're sitting right in front of you, and it just puts things into perspective. It helped me, like, get to the next point in my life to be able to move forward and just, you know, have some extra cash in my pocket, whereas I really needed it at the time. Tal vez si no me ofrecen que me van a pagar, tal vez no vengo. Pero después que estoy aquí, como me la pas no la pasamos bien, no podemos de So that is um, a bit about the project, Look at Art, Get Paid. So that pilot took place at the RISD Museum and spanned... Um, we went on to uh, work with the museum based on the critique. So those were people who had never been to an art museum before. We prioritized people of color, folks with disabilities, and then we aggregated their critiques and basically worked with um, the leadership at the museum to implement changes at the museum. So that included um, uh, changing their acquisition policy, um, getting their written materials translated into four different languages because they were only in English. Um, getting advertisements up on the south side in Providence um, where uh, the majority um, of the population is Spanish speaking um, and also being involved in a restitution process um, for a bronze sculpture that was looted during colonial violence. So those were all things that we worked with the RISD Museum on um, after doing this project, uh, kind of integrating the public's critiques um, into the museum's operations. And then um, the project has been adapted by a few different institutions, the University uh, of Massachusetts Amherst, um, and also uh, even an opera house, uh, Toledo Opera, um, did kind of a paid adaptation of folks who had never been to the opera before. Um, so again, uh, ha just thinking about how this might, um, oh, and this is just us presenting that video you just saw to the RISD Museum staff. Um, so, this is all kind of very much facing the institution of RISD, and um, so there's activism you could be doing within MICA. There's also activism and ways you could be contributing as a community member um, and someone living in Baltimore. Um, and so this is one little example of what a social practice project might look like. Um, you know, it kind of looks like a focus group when we're doing the group critiques. It kind of looks like 
um, a sleeping, like sleep research campaign. We advertised in buses, you know, alongside people like the, the ads saying like, do you have sleep problems? Participate in this study. Except our ad said, does going to a museum sound like work will pay you? Um, so, you know, we're, we were playing with different forms um, to occupy like legible forms of social um, kind of engagement, but then using that to the end of social practice and social change. Um, so just to close out, um, I will be teaching a class open to all years. So even, it's not just FYE, um, it will be open to all years. So in subsequent years, if you're interested in social practice, um, this class, Art for Social Change, is a great way to get to know um, this new genre and to really incorporate activist uh, work into your practice and your studies at MICA. Um, so thank you so much. Hello everyone. How's it going? Hey y'all. See my, my students that I see in the audience. All right. Um, so I'm Kelly Williams. I teach in FYE under the same social practice. Me and Maya are kind of like the two like <laughs> sides of the FYE social practice faculty body. Um, I teach haptics and optics, two sections, and I also teach in photo. I also teach in animation. And so I'm going to talk to you all about how I approach my social practice, which is very different than Maya's, which is very interesting how social practice is this name that I never considered my work until it started to become a, a conversation. Um, it was just me making work that I thought was important and doing the stuff that I like to do with my you know, skills. So I have three different ways that I approach social practice. Um, one is through this kind of commission-based like projects. Um, the Cops and Robbers would be one example of that. One is through my kind of personal projects that in involves kind of augmented reality. So the artwork is a part of it, but the experience and how people experience is really the part that's a little bit <laughs> more important to me. Um, and then there's the kind of community and socially engaged kind of work that's kind of outward facing with the community. And that's in this kind of top third with the eyes. Um, so I'm going to talk about a bunch of different ways how I approach that. What does High School Musical have to do with my social practice? Um, I do a lot of work about social media. Um, I grew up with social media, I feel like. I feel like I grew up with the group who really learned about it when we were young. Um, so I really loved Black Planet. I was into MySpace. I was into all this you know, these virtual spaces that allowed you to like kind of craft your identity. And um, one thing that I really loved about these spaces is that I had the, the power to dictate what I wanted people to see. Um, and I got really into augmenting those spaces. So I really loved High School Musical and Zac Efron. So my first like augmented, <laughs> augmentation of, of my kind of my space was to make this pop art version of uh, Zac Efron. I tried to find the actual like page, but I couldn't find it. Um, but it was really interesting to me because that really, really was really powerful to me with how I can like start to craft my identity. Um, it was also the first place where I experienced overt racism too. So it was this place where I had, I could really craft this identity and I could really be whoever I wanted to be. And then there was this kind of dark side to it. And I was really interested in that connection. So in my personal work, I've kind of been talking about that for years. Every time I think that I'm outside of that, I, come back to it. Um, and it was in 2016 during the presidential elections with Trump and Hillary um, that it really became very clear to me how powerful social media was. Um, I was trying to figure out my project. Every time I say I'm done, I'm like, I don't want to talk about social media anymore. I find myself somehow bringing it back because I thought that it was really interesting how some of these really important conversations and movements were happening on social media. And even people who didn't use social media was affected by social media in some way. And it became very clear during that moment. Um, so I created a web series called This Is True um, that lived inside of social media. <laughs> she was 
really a kind of embodiment of myself. Um, and really, she wanted to understand the world. And I wanted to use each episode to really start to think about some of the things that I'm experiencing on social media at the time. So this is true, the, the character that I created um, as like the kind of main character. Um, and from there, I started to think about these kind of social media identities. Um, these are also kind of based off my family. Um, but you had the kind of TMZ kind of person who loves all the celebrity gossip, like that kind of part of social media that was represented. And Ruth, the mother, who's really into those kind of things. And then you have the kind of conspiracy theory, the old school kind of social media, also kind of based off of my family, my father. Um, <laughs> and so that kind of character in social media. So then you have Tony, the character who wants to be super famous in social media. That's her goal in life is to just be famous. Um, so representing that kind of character in social media. And then you have T, which is actually like my favorite character. If you've ever seen Boondocks, she's very similar to Riley. She's an activist, um, but she's also five. And she's a representation of what I call the new woke, is what I call them. Um, the person who's always calling people out on social media, um, but is also like posting unchecked sources and like, you know, they mean well, but you know, that is that naivete is kind of shown in this kind of five-year-old person. And she loved Michelle Obama. <laughs> I was very proud of my little stickers. Um, so from there, I started also to craft spaces um, that is representing this kind of idea of social media spaces. So this was True's Room, which is acting as like that kind of feed, that kind of home page on MySpace, well, on MySpace, on Facebook, um, where you can have that scroll. Um, and I'm really thinking about this idea of like crafting spaces. The walls are, were meant to scroll. Um, these are all sourced, all the imagery was sourced from like the music I was listening to and the kind of things that I'm seeing on social media. So like pulling images directly from social media. This was the, what is the name of mine? It's called Clicks. No, it's called Sunday's Bar and Grill. <laughs> Um, and this was representing everything social that is social media. And then, oh, you don't want to play this time. Cool. And then you have, we just fixed this, and then, okay, I'm just going to show it to you like this. No? Obviously, I talked about Kim Kardashian and the Kardashians. <laughs> but through this, I used um, each episode to kind of talk about really important topics that I feel like are being talked about in social media and amplified through social media. So this was one, um, this episode was called The Dome Piece and it's thinking about what uh, cultures we are allowed to appropriate. Um, so it's this kind of fictional fashion trend that is really a yarmulke um, where I feel like black culture is very heavily, is very heavily you know, appropriated and then, but it's not always the same in all cultures. So kind of thinking about that through that episode. This is really thinking about um, kind of user privacy and user interface. Um, oh, this is the dome piece right here. This was the, some excerpts from the dome piece. Technical issues, y'all. Um, so thinking about that, that relationship. And so this episode is, they're not allowing me to skip. Okay, here we go. And so this episode, which is also now not playing, is an episode that is called um, The Autocorrect, and thinking about user interface and this idea of privacy and privacy settings um, on social media. Um, and True makes a very, very embarrassing typo that made to it for a very embarrassing moment with her family um, in this little last clip right here. So I was really interested in how um, comedy also is used. I was studying people like Dave Chappelle and Key, Key and Pill and people like that who uses their comedy to start to make conversations that can be very heavy and unaccessible, very accessible to viewers. So these are all comedic episodes. If you want to see the episodes, they're on my website. I want to go quickly through this so we make sure we get to you. Um, so in my more recent work, I'm also starting to think about augmented reality. Um, and I really was drawn to the idea of augmented reality because it feels so invasive. You have to physically use your phone to trigger an image on top of a photo. Um, and I was thinking, I was asked to do a show. I knew the show was going to be predominantly white. 
viewers just because of the area. Um, and I wanted to think about what it kind of how it feels to have this kind of, um, I was wondering who has the power in the situation and thinking about social media. Um, so this is some <laughs> of the kind of <laughs> documentation. Take your videos. Okay. And then they know that the videos exist. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So I'd like to shout out to the dogs. So each character is um, supposed to kind of depict a very private moment of um, creating their own identity. These are the same characters six ways, six times. Um, and they're all inspired by uh, movements that shows kind of the breadth of what blackness can be. So thinking about the Afro-punk movement, thinking about the kind of kawaii style, thinking about um, the black dandy style. Um, I just feel like it's a very narrow view of what blackness can look like in media. And so I feel like social media is also thinking, is really like highlighting some of those things too. All right, so then I also make collaborative work. So this is a project that I worked with, um, created with a group of students at Morgan State University. Um, this was in 2015. Um, actually, this project started right before the Freddie Gray uprisings. This was something that was in the work and then it just became even more relevant. This was something, the first, uh, the day of the uprisings in 2015, if you don't know about the uprisings, just look it up. And Baltimore is a very important and a moment in Baltimore history um, with police brutality um, and just thinking about what that means in Baltimore. It was a very transformative moment. And this was the day that it actually was happening. We was premiering for the photos just in a student exhibition. And in this project, it was an inside out wheat paste project that we created with two classes um, where we're thinking about it, it was just a theme, Black Lives Matter. Um, and we didn't want to just make a project where we had a project called Black Lives Matter and we show black people <laughs> on the building. Um, but we wanted to, through photography, show this idea of like invisible boundaries that can be placed on black bodies. Um, so these were some of the images that we took. It was 42 participants that um, participated in the project and it was ultimately Pasted on the new Open Works building, that's where it, this is the old building of Open Works. So this is right before they changed it to the Open Works building. And this was the side of the building, so just taking some of those images and pasting them on the walls. And it's very interesting because Micah has such a big presence in that kind of particular section, but then there's a neighborhood that's right next to it that's I feel like getting gobbled up by, by the arts district, um, but it's not, really working or had any interest to um, to really work together with the, the existing community. And it was really interesting that this building was like right at the tip of the arts district and that neighborhood. And there was um, just an appreciation from the community that they're seeing themselves on the wall, which I thought was really great. Um, and then the day when we started to actually paste on the walls, that was the same day of the church shootings. So it was just all these reminders that Unfortunately, this work is still, unfortunately, too relevant to right now. So this is a project that I worked on recently called Cops and Robbers. Um, it came out in, on Netflix on 20, 2020. Um, the project was a short film that was created to a poem that was created after the Ahmaud Aubrey shootings. Um, then during the Freddie Gray and Breonna Taylor kind of uprisings around the world, um, they asked artists to kind of reflect on what's going on right now. Um, donate everything, all time was donated. Netflix, this was not anything tied to Netflix. Netflix actually picked the project up after we finished the project. Um, but all proceeds went to a Black Lives Matter organization and also funding animation programs in Morgan State University and another HBCU. Um, and I was asked to do a 15 second animation that is kind of talking about the experience of the mother. Um, and I remember seeing 
um, watching CNN and just seeing George Floyd's family just like start breaking down on TV. And I started to think about what it feels like to have to publicly mourn a person in something like this. So that's what my kind of inspiration was for my piece. So this is my section in the animation. May I am his mother. And so these are just some, also some clips of other artists, other sections of the film. All right, and the last thing I'm gonna talk about is a project that I actually did with some students um, that was called Game the Gallery. And this was a project where I taught students how to use augmented reality, um, how to do kind of projection work, how to do um, some kind of digital work that can be applied in any way that they want. Um, to the gallery space at Moore College of Art and Design. Um, I just told them that they had to obstruct the space or work with the current exhibition in some way. Um, and they really felt like the gallery just wasn't welcoming to them. They thought that it was something that they felt like they weren't supposed to touch, they weren't supposed to be in for very long. They had to you know, act right, keep it cute, they felt similar to what you were kind of doing. Um, so they actually decided to make a escape room and they created this lore around it and really thinking about like challenging how you are supposed to act in a space. So thinking about how to challenge systems, but also in a playful way. I'm all about humor and play um, in, you know, when it's appropriate. So that brings me to social practice and emerging media. Um, this is a class that I will be teaching next year, um, first semester, fall semester. And it's just gonna be thinking about how emerging media is used to um, create art that is meant to create change or to, you know, social practice work. Um, so if you're interested, we're hopefully gonna do some projects similar to the project I just showed. I feel like I went over time though, so that's all I got. Thank you. All right. Um, well, uh, pretty esteemed uh, colleagues and what powerful work to be on the same stage with. So feel pretty honored to be uh, part of my colleagues' presentation up here. Thanks to FYE, uh, thanks Elizabeth, and thanks to Carissa for introducing us. My name is Hugh Pocock up there, um, and I'm gonna do this kind of quickly. Um, I'm FYE faculty. Uh, I'm also a faculty in the Ecosystem Sustainability and Justice major, and I'm uh, currently the program coordinator for it. I'm also a bunch of other stuff. Uh, you know, I do a lot of different things in this idea of art and life and life and art. I really believe that my work is, comes out of my life and my work really informs my life. So there's a whole lot of things going on, just like you are as well. Um, and this is sort of mix of who we are and what we make and how do we do that. Um, I've always been an artist. I, I had the uh, real privilege of being able to make art for most of my life. Um, you know, uh, uh, bad at math. 
couldn't go anywhere else. I got to go to art school, and uh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I got to make art the rest of my life. Um, so I do, I I'm really interested in this planet, this big ball of energy that we live on, and how do we engage with it? You know, where are we with it? Um, I'm interested in the future. You know, the future exists. Uh, uh, it's in super doubt, but we're gonna be there sooner or later. Uh, this is a project about inviting people to meet again in the future. Um, and currently, I'm really sort of, uh, the work that I'm working on a lot now is around uh, the rights of nature and that our non-human cousins really deserve uh, and have as much right to be here as we do and that we need to decenter the human from the middle of our consciousness and just share equally our planet. And this is a project I did about cutting a hole in a fence to let the rabbits run through freely there. Um, my, uh, and then some uh, pieces like, can we share human agency and give it away? You know, like humans, we really have too much power on this planet. So can we teach rabbits to make fire and then maybe arm the bears so they can shoot back? <laughs> I think would be good. Um, uh, and uh, recently, the uh, project, which is a long-term project that I'm working on, is about creating a, uh, a, a space where uh, humans aren't allowed, uh, and that it is a, a non-human space uh, where we can uh, maybe look inside to the place where we can't go. And the non-human inhabitants, from the birds to the microbes, uh, have legal right to be there. So that's no man's land there. Um, so, but I wanted to pause because this idea of like who we are and what we're doing here, uh, since you all are here, I wanted to take advantage of this to also share with you this really exciting project that we're working on at MICA uh, to do with our teaching. Because our teaching, you know, uh, we're uh, creative people, artists that you have as your faculty, and we uh, get to share that with you in different ways. So. Um, we are, over the past five years, we've uh, built this new major called the Ecosystem Sustainability and Justice Major. Uh, and this is pretty exciting because it's just launching here at MICA that you're stepping into. This is the only undergraduate pro <coughs> program of its kind in the United States in an art and design school. Um, so it's some of you out there might be beginning to think about, I want my art and design practice to engage with the greater world and perhaps work to transform it into a place that more, has more equity for all, including uh, humans and non-humans. You might be, you know, you'd be thinking about lots of other things as well, but not like it has to be just one thing. But this might be something you want to think about doing because how do you start to work like that? How do you start to transform your creative practice whatever it is, into a way that intersects with these different kinds of ideas. Or well, if we could find one word that meant <clears throat> ecosystem, sustainability, and justice, we'd use that. But these are all intertwined ideas. The environment, social justice, the future of the planet, they're all kind of intertwined with each other. OK, I'm going to keep going really pretty quickly here. Oh, I got some time. Um, so, uh, we've done something really cool here in that we've made a major that's really super serious but also has a lot of open free time, open space in it. We have 13 studio electives, which is the most of any major at MICA, uh, with a core that goes up through the middle of it of sophomore, junior, and senior seminars. So this is a studio major that's really housed within also liberal arts because there's a lot of ideas, discussion, context, information, science that goes into it. So you have these and all of those majors, all of those studio electives, you can take anywhere in the school. It doesn't have to be a kind of ESJ studio. You could do a lot of illustration, a lot of animation, a lot of ceramics, a lot of sculpture, a lot of fiber, the list goes on, a lot of game design, you know, all of those with those studio electives, but you're beginning to think about how you can use that to go towards these sort of central themed focus here. Um, uh, 
so it's a li liberal arts and you have a strong concentration in, this, in, in science. We have three uh, studio electives in science and these science courses uh, are really heavily informed by this uh, uh, intersection of social justice, the human and the non-human. Uh, and you, have a, uh, you take three studio electives from a, a menu there, and then you have the um, non-Western art history elective. Instead of two history electives, one of these is a required non-Western history elective to decenter the Western canon out of this so entirely. And then you'll take the intersectional environmental, ESJ 310, which is the core liberal arts course taught by Carissa Aoki here, which is around the intersection of race, gender, and env environmental justice, to say very briefly. Um, so that's a really cool, that's the sort of information density of the, uh, of the major. Uh, so this is some of this really amazing pool of uh, a menu of science courses that are uh, being developed by Chris Aoki and Alec Armstrong. Uh, some really exciting classes and I would like to take all of them myself. Um, so this is sort of a bit of what it might look like uh, were you to be a ESJ major. Um, and uh, give yourselves a hand. You're in your spring of your FYE year. You're nearly done. Congratulations. Uh, if you were uh, uh, jump into this you, uh, for next semester, you would talk with your advisor about taking ESJ 201, intro to ESJ um, uh, for next fall. Uh, and then you have two open studio electives each semester and then a uh, science. So that would be your, and then in that uh, sophomore level class, you're beginning to learn about how do other artists deal with this? How do you start to be engaged with uh, outside organizations? How do you start transforming your work to be intersecting with other groups, uh, being part of the world around you? Uh, we're just focusing a lot <clears throat> on some specific areas of social practice here, but that's not like this is just a social practice major. There'll be a lot of different outcomes for this. Uh, junior level, uh, you have your junior seminar, and then you're getting more serious. You know, you're getting to, you're getting to be good at this. Um, you've, you've learned the ethics the, and some of the skills of working with other groups, with um, pres uh, integrating your work into um, outside of MICA situations. This major is really about being not just here, you know, about being in Baltimore, about being a national, being more global with your work. And then you have the uh, two studio electives um, over the course of the um, uh, uh, year and then you're also one of these semesters you're probably going to be taking the ESJ 310 liberal arts um, course. Okay and then senior year is your capstone year. Uh, so you're developing a pretty significant body of work there. You have a significant project <clears throat> with which you've been building up to all this time um, and you have three studio electives each semester and all that work is being fed into your capstone. So this is the project also that will launch you out of MICA as well. And I can't say enough, um, uh, in my personal um, opinion, uh, the world is changing rapidly in front of us. Uh, climate change is really on all of our minds and the underlying social justice issues that will be amplified from it are going to be part of the world that you all are entering into. So if you're into this stuff, this is the place at school to become educated in the language and the skills and the concepts and how to be part of that. Um, it's a good way to get hired, too, if you know what you're talking about. So I um, really also want to say that the students that are in this, this is brand new. You know, this is really exciting. You know, uh, uh, so you'll be part of a, a community of like-minded students that are stepping into this really new space and helping co-create what goes on in this. It's a place where you'll meet other students that are like into this stuff and that you can trade information and share, you know, things that are going on outside of school, uh, talk to them about ideas that you're interested in as well. So, um, you know, like it's good at schools to like find your, your tribe 
kind of thing, and you all are probably finding that a lot, you know, but this is a place for, I would say, uh, where, you know, uh, this, this is this tribe. <laughs> um, want to emphasize that uh, ESJ 201 class. Uh, it really is a, a, a place that you might want to, that you can take next semester, whether you want to be a, a major or not. You might be thinking, hey, this sounds kind of interesting. I would like to learn more about this. How can I actually start developing these skills in my work? But I really still want to be a ceramics major, you know? Or I still really want to be a illustration major. I highly recommend you take this class. You can take a photo of that so you can tell your, um, uh, because it's open to everyone. You don't have to be a major to go into it. But either you're in it and you're like, okay, I'm done, I wanna go back. Or you're like, say, oh, okay, I wanna now commit to this major and you've done it. You know, you don't have to be like, oh, now I, now I wanna take this again. So this is something for you to be thinking about <clears throat> when you're registering for classes. What am I doing here? Oh, only four more minutes here. Follow us on Instagram. I'll pause here for a moment so you could do this. Do this for a moment. I was gonna take a picture of you all. Look, there's some pictures coming up. Here, I'll take, hold on a second. I wanna take a picture of you all following us on Instagram, and I'm gonna post it on Instagram. <laughs> That's cool, okay. Um, you can email us as well, and uh, come to our open house. Uh, next Monday in M110, uh, we will have free pizza. And uh, so come by and learn more. And you can also meet uh, more some of the students that are in it. Uh, uh, Carissa and Alec will be there so that you can talk to them about what they do as well. Um, I do have a few minutes, so I'm gonna race through a little bit of what some of this might look like. And again, it's totally not what it always will look like. Uh, it's brand new major, so there haven't been studio cl classes that are directly ESJ classes, but there's been classes that are around it. This is North Avenue Forum, <clears throat> which came right after the Freddie Gray killing on North Avenue. And uh, Micah was extremely impacted by that as well. We were here, and it's like, what do we do? So uh, we started, we thought that maybe we could, Micah could be a place where there could be a discussion amongst the many different people uh, along North Avenue and they could, we could uh, come here and start to have dialogues about what different people were thinking and talking about. It was extremely powerful uh, for everyone involved. So the students were also co-creators of that discussion and that was really a social practice uh, 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 course where how do you start to design and also make the settings for a type of conversation like that that was really very intense, very, very cool. Um, we had a great potluck afterwards out on North Avenue with 7th Metro Church, which is just down the street. Uh, Seeds of Rage was a collaboration between MICA students and Baltimore musicians to create uh, awareness and signage for a climate march on Washington. Uh, so there was a lot of talking, a lot of like, what's going on here, Micah, we don't know if we trust you or not, right? You know, how do you navigate Baltimore uh, when you're coming from a place like Micah inside of in, in Baltimore? So there's a lot of navigating of that. Um, had a great show and uh, had a really pretty amazing contingent of uh, 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 Baltimoreans going down to Washington for the climate march down there. Um, there's other classes here which are about really engaging with Baltimore on different uh, issues from food to water to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, different sort of open food justice things. Um, I'm going really pretty fast on purpose here. Uh, okay. Yep. Uh, there's water. So how do you be part of your city and how do you learn about your work um, from different avenues, different ways of approaching it? Uh, we also uh, have made art inside of galleries as well. You know, this is, like you can approach this in a lot of different ways. So standalone art pieces, uh, students put on performances, do art shows, and we have critiques. So inside of those seminars, we talk about your work 
and how you're doing, and is this good? Is it effective? People are making really pretty amazing work. Uh, this is a, 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 a material design project uh, working with alternative uh, materials. Really nice. Um, this is about someone uh, redesigning uh, 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 shorelines for climate change. Interesting performative work. Okay, all right. And if you wanna see more of my work, you can uh, follow me. Well, you can look at my website up there. Okay, I'm done. Good. Oh, we're at time. We're at time. So um, thank you, everyone. I think we're at time. Um, but you can certainly contact any of our faculty speakers here. They would love to talk with you. Thanks for coming to the lectures this year. Um, it's been great. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. <laughs>